Three months after Brumaire, Napoleon still did not consider himself sufficiently master of the situation to employ the full powers granted him by the Constitution. He did not exactly hesitate, but he proceeded with caution. He wished before forging ahead to understand, test, and control the machinery to replace and reconstruct what did not work well, either according to older patterns or after designs which his own experience and inventiveness suggested to him. He did not rely upon himself alone, but sought counsel and advice. He applied about each matter to those who understood it. He quickly saw that the machinery of government had stopped working for the last 10 years after running smoothly until then. Who had been responsible for its efficiency? It was neither the king, nor the court, nor the ministry, but the staff, which had been trained, taught, and educated for administration, the head clerks, the overseers, the officials, and the public servants, men who had toiled in the collar steadily and tirelessly and earned the name of plotters. They had taken pride in doing their work with regularity and had been contented to seek for no other reward than their ordinary pay and a sense of conscientious satisfaction. They lived for their business and troubled themselves only about such matters as were entrusted to them, but those they knew thoroughly and they had no political opinions of their own. They had a strong bet for order, method, well drawn up documents, clear accounts, and straight dealing. The revolution shocked their feelings and disturbed their habits. Besides, it drove them away. Some of them were even killed. The survivors had since then remained unnoticed. A few had come forward to get elected to the councils, but they met with scant success. Bonaparte sought for these men, drew them from obscurity, and gave them offices. They proved the most useful and devoted assistance in his work. They immediately threw themselves into the business and reduced matters to order. The essential thing in government is to seek out the men who know and set them to work. But on every side, there were conflicting parties and Bonaparte was obliged to survey the country and see who could be won over to his cause and whom it was necessary to attack. There was no need to win over the Republicans. They had themselves drawn up the Constitution and stood by it and him. He had only to get the utmost assistance out of each one of them by applying him to the work of which he was most capable. Even those who had at first been excluded from the councils for resisting the coup d'etat were, for the most part, employed. Only the anarchists were exiled from favor. At the same time, Bonaparte did not form in insoluble alliance with the Montagnards, whom he admitted to the government. Those who were his protectors in former days had disappeared for the most part, dead, outlawed, and dishonored. Young Robespierre, Thoreau, Frere Rome, Talian, Barris, even Salicetti, he abandoned to his brothers. Against certain Corsican representatives, he showed dislike and even hostility, although they had proved themselves very useful to him before. And this was all the stranger because they had until then been most intimate with him. He availed himself of all the other members, but he bound himself to none. No one had any power over him or dared presume upon an old acquaintance except Talleyrand and Fouché. They were exceptions and maintained an influence which no disclosure closures about them could shake. He knew that they were unfaithful, dishonest, and treacherous, yet he took no account of it. Did he hold them necessary to his purpose? Was their sagacity indispensable? Was he addicted to them by bonds that he could not sever? This is a dark corner of history, and every explanation offered hitherto is insufficient. With regard to the anti-Republicans, he had maintained, ever since his first appearance, the attitude of a soldier. Even the proclamations of his army before Fructidor, which were justified by the anti-military attacks on the Clichans, were explicable in the same manner. He had taken too long. He was under orders. He had fired the Canada of Vendemire. He was under orders. He had sent Ogaro to help the plot of Fructidor. He was under orders. He had taken part in Paris at a Republican holiday from the 15th of Frimer to the 14th of Floreal, which was the anniversary of the 21st of January. Where he was under orders in all these affairs. He had acted not as Citizen Bonaparte, but as general or a member of the Institute. Whatever his real opinions were, he showed none that might commit 
or chip him up. Then the royalists, remembering his noble birth, said he had been educated by the king and married a turncoat royalist, hoped that he would prove a monk, the Catholics better informed, knowing his conduct in Italy and how he had treated the Pope and priesthood, expected a Constantine with the latter. He determined to come to an immediate understanding if they could consent to be simply Catholics, and if the church would cease to champion the throne. He did not fear religion, nor for the present did the framers of the new constitution. Men of religion, cried Cabani. In whatever manner you adore the unknown power of nature or that omnipotent God whom you choose to suppose rules directly over human destinies, the freedom of your worship shall be preserved. And if your teachings help to foster a good and healthy morality in the heart, they shall be respected even by those who do not believe in them. Whoever desired the practice of the Catholic religion as a spiritual need and not as an instrument of civil strife, would be won over sooner or later. Then the anti-Republican forces would be cut in two. The most influential part would be lost. At enthusiasm wane, the numbers and recruits fall off. No understanding, on the other hand, was possible with the royalists. Bonaparte had too good a sense of his own worth and position to play a demurrier Pichigro. It was through the revolution that he attempted to reconcile all Frenchmen. Not by means of the counter-revolution. None of the essential work done by that movement could be sacrificed. The revolution was France. Thereupon followed a sudden rupture with the royalists, who, in looking for a tool, met with the most formidable enemy that the monarchy, by divine right, had ever encountered. Others could be seduced by plotting and bribery, or if they were unwilling, different means could be found. Throughout these party struggles, which sapped the strength of the country, the Bourbons and Foreigners were continually found fanning the flames of dissension. Sound familiar? Bonaparte was neither shaken nor seduced. The powers of government which he organized and employed were not such as could be easily overcome through their incoherence, decentralization, and independence of the central authority, or such as under which the royalists could, if it peacefully exist, he held them grouped in his hand and controlled them in such a manner that every man, military or civil, owed his position to him. It was an no use for the royalists to ask for peace and pretend submission while keeping back their arms. With him, it was necessary to behave openly. Such trickeries were of no avail. He would answer them with a dozen bullets, which was brutal but effective. What then was to be done? Kill him. <laughs>